All right, hello everyone and welcome back for more biotechnology. So we are starting a new chapter here and the focus of this chapter is going to be getting fundamental principles out of the way in terms of cells, cell functions, a lot of basic biology and biochemistry, things that we're going to need to have in our tool belts when we move on and actually talk about biotech techniques in the future. So let's go ahead and get after it here. So this picture that came from your textbook shows a uh, paramecium cell. So this is an example of a unicellular eukaryote. Uh, unicellular meaning the whole organism is made up of just one cell. And uh, eukaryote is a term that we will define a little bit later on. Uh, so these are organisms that live in fresh water sources. So for example, if you say were working on some biotech application and you picked a paramecium as your organism to study or manipulate, we would need to understand a few things about that organism before we really know how to approach our technique. We need to know what it's made of at the molecular level. We need to know how the cell operates, what sorts of functions that the cell does, and all uh, kind of operations that it does on a normal basis. And we need to know what it's potentially capable of. So biotech, as we define it in chapter one, is all about manipulating cells to get them to do or produce things that we want, right? So even if uh, your biotech application is not something that the cell ordinarily does, we need to at least know if the cell that we're picking as our guinea pig, as it were, we need to know that it's capable of doing what we want it to do. So again, like we talked about in chapter one, really unlocking the potential of biotechnology as a field, it's gonna require simultaneous knowledge of several different scientific fields. And this is going to include cell biology, which is a lot of what we're gonna talk about in this chapter, uh, biochemistry, which is something that we'll kind of get later on in the course, anatomy and physiology, not so much, but, if you go back to the insulin example that we talked about in chapter one, insulin is something that very much func functions in human physiology and of course the physiology of other uh, mammals as well. So you have to kind of know the physiology of how insulin works to get blood glucose uh, uh, into cells to really understand what the purpose is of actually producing it in a biotech setting. Okay, so Again, as we said, biotech is all about picking the right organism for whatever your application is. So let's go ahead and quickly classify what kind of organisms we could work with. So we have unicellular organisms. We saw an example of that on the previous slide with the paramecium. Uh, so uni is a prefix that means one. So these are single-celled organisms. And what that implies is that every single cell represents a, an individual and sometimes unique organism, although depending on how these organisms reproduce, every single organism may be genetically identical to all the other organisms in a colony. So a lot of bacteria are good examples of that. They don't uh, really generate a whole lot of genetic diversity when they reproduce, certainly not like uh, us. So unicellular organisms, this will include all prokaryotes. Again, that's a term that we'll define a little bit later on. That includes uh, bacteria, and then even some single-celled eukaryotes like the paramecium that we saw, uh, algae, and yeast. So those are single-celled uh, cells, uh, single-celled organisms, uh, but the distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is definitely something that we'll want to pay attention to later on. And again, for reasons that we'll discuss later on in the course, single-celled organisms tend to be a lot easier to manipulate in biotech settings, especially when it comes to bacteria like E. coli. And then multicellular organisms are much more complex organisms that uh, have cells organized into tissues and organs. So the major difference here is that if you isolate one single cell from a multicellular organism, that is not in, its, in and of itself an individual organism. Rather, it's a small part of a whole organism. So multicellular organisms will include uh, all animals, uh, most animals, uh, plants, uh, a lot of fungi, yeast are an example of a fungus that is single-celled, but most fungi will be multicellular. Uh, 
So a multicellular organism, in this case, it's not going to be just like 10 or 20 cells. Usually it's going to be uh, in the millions to trillions of cells. There will be some that are maybe in the hundreds, but most will be millions to trillions. Human beings, for example, are usually somewhere between 30 and 40 trillion cells per organism. So if you consider both unicellular and multicellular organisms together, that, that's pretty much it, right? There's, those are the only two ways we can really very generally and broadly classify organisms. And it's estimated that planet Earth uh, houses somewhere between 20 and 150 million unique species of organisms. Now that's kind of a broad range. Uh, so it, whether you want to be kind of closer to 20 or 150 is probably going to de uh, depend on your interpretation and your uh, philosophy on that sort of thing. Uh, most species, obviously, if you're considering the 150, would be yet to be identified and discovered and named. But it is thought that most organisms on Earth are unicellular, meaning that we can't see them with our eyes, which is... Uh, kind of makes a figure like this even more impressive. So this is something that if you haven't already had a introductory biology class, this is definitely something that you will see early on. Uh, this table that, or this chart that you're seeing on the far right is what's called the levels of biological organization. So basically this is just showing that for any given organism, like you're seeing a frog or a corn plant at the very top, there is kind of a layering or hierarchy system for how things are organized. Basically, a whole organism is made up of certain things, and then that certain thing is made up of even simpler and simpler parts. So we can basically deconstruct a whole organism into individual building blocks. So the way this goes is that you start at the top at the most complex, at the organismal level, like a frog or a corn plant, and then if you're dealing with a, multicellular, with a multicellular organism, you're going to have organs. Organs are made up of tissues. Uh, tissues are made up of cells. Cells uh, contain organelles, which are made up of molecules, and molecules are made up of atoms. So as you go from top to bottom, you go from very complex to as simple as it can possibly be. And once you get below the atomic level, then things cannot be any simpler because... If you've ever taken a chemistry class, you learn that kind of the deal with an atom is that that is the simplest unit of matter that can exist, at least on its own. So simplest unit of matter, living or non-living, this is an important uh, point to make, uh, both living matter and non-living matter, it's all made up of atoms, right? So uh, that is our simplest unit of matter. Uh, but the interesting thing, one distinction that we can make between living and non-living matter is that living matter tends to be made up of a certain type of atom. So usually it's going to be carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And that makes a nice, easy-to-remember mnemonic device called schnapps. Those six elements make up about 95% of all living matter. Now, there, are, there will be other things like sodium and potassium and iron, uh, but those are going to over everything else besides those six elements is going to make up the remaining 5%. Most of it's going to be these six right here. So once you get past the atomic stage, you get up to the molecular stage. Molecules consist of atoms that are bound together with chemical bonds. So Molecules can also consist of an organic and a non-organic variety. Now, this is different than our comparison of living and non-living matter. Living matter consists of both organic and non-organic molecules. So, a perfect example of a non-organic molecule would be water. So, uh, the definition, the strict definition of an organic molecule is one that contains both carbon and hydrogen. So, since water doesn't contain carbon, technically it's a non-organic molecule molecule, but it is obviously extremely important to living organisms, right? So for that reason, water is the medium in which all life activities place, uh, take place. So water consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom bound together in a single molecule. You can see it down here. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, uh, another inorganic molecule because it doesn't contain hydrogen, is a byproduct of cellular respiration, a major, very important activity that cells in our body undertake. Uh, 
So carbon dioxide consists of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, again, bound together in chemical bonds. But most of what we'll end up talking about uh, in terms of molecules are much, much, much larger and much more complex. We call these macromolecules. So you can see a protein here and a nucleic acid like DNA over here. These are very large, very complex molecules that consist of many, many atoms that are bound together in a very complex network of chemical bonds. So macromolecules like proteins and nucleic acids are going to be really what drives life processes that allow uh, the functioning of a cell and an organism to really take place. Uh, we've already seen several examples of how proteins are very common products that are produced and sold by biotech companies. TPA was one of them. Insulin was one of them. Proteins are kind of what cells are in charge of making. It's kind of the lifeblood of a cell. Cells make proteins, and a lot of what biotechnology is all about is manipulating cells to make proteins that we want, that we can harvest, and that we can sell. So here we can actually see a couple of other examples of important molecules in biology. We've already looked at water and carbon dioxide, so let's go ahead and look at a few more. Maybe you'll recognize some of these, maybe you won't, but either way, it should be educational. So we've already seen insulin. So insulin, we mentioned, is a protein. So what you're seeing here in this diagram, something that we will familiarize ourselves more with as we make it to the end of this chapter, insulin and other proteins are polymers of molecules called amino acids. So every single one of these little circles you see here is an individual amino acid that has formed a chemical bond with another amino acid. So we basically just form a big chain here. So this whole big thing that you see right here is insulin. Uh, glucose, a simple sugar molecule, is a very important molecule in biology because it is most commonly the starting point for cellular respiration. We get a lot of glucose out of the food that we eat. We digest the food that we eat. We absorb glucose into the bloodstream. And to regulate the amount of glucose in the bloodstream, that is why we need this hormone insulin, as we discussed. Oxygen is a molecule, so oxygen in the air that we breathe, very important. It's necessary for cellular respiration to take place. Uh, cholesterol, you can see down here, a very complex looking molecule consisting of atoms bound in these ring structures. You can see these hydrogen atoms kind of sticking off at different angles. Uh, cholesterol, very important. It is a part of plasma membranes, and it is also how we synthesize steroid hormones like uh, testosterone and estrogen and aldosterone and cortisol and anything else that is a steroid hormone. Uh, cholesterol gets a bad rap. People just assume it's a bad thing, but it's actually a very good thing. But obviously, you don't want too much of a good thing. DNA we have talked about a little bit in terms of genes and how we can manipulate genes, uh, but we'll talk a lot more about DNA later on in this chapter and then as we go throughout the course, obviously DNA is going to be a very central focus for us as we continue throughout the course throughout the semester, but DNA is extremely complex in how the molecules kind of bind together and work together, so you can kind of see what it looks like there and we'll have more to say about that in another video. Uh, hemoglobin, another very complex protein that you see here. It's a much bigger and much more complex protein than even insulin. Hemoglobin, notably, functions in carrying oxygen around your blood. So we're seeing a lot of connection between some of these molecules that we're looking at here. And then something that I'm sure you've heard a lot about in the age of COVID that we're all living in right now, antibodies. Antibodies are a common topic in terms of uh, immune responses, and hopefully it will play a central story in how we eventually beat the coronavirus. Uh, so antibodies are kind of like hemoglobin, very complex proteins that work in recognition of foreign uh, substances called antigens. So those are just some examples of important molecules in biology. By no means is it an exhaustive list, but that's just kind of a good place for us to start. Okay, so let's move on to something that I teased a little bit beforehand. So uh, prokaryotic cells versus eukaryotic cells, what is the difference? 
So let's start by uh, defining what a prokaryotic cell is. Prokaryotic cells are very simple. I mentioned that prokaryotes tend to be a lot easier to manipulate than eukaryotic cells, and it is because of their simplicity. Prokaryotic cells do not contain membrane-bound organelles. So you're seeing some examples of organelles here like mitochondria and chloroplasts. I would not necessarily uh, define a ribosome as a membrane-bound organelle because prokaryotes do have ribosomes, but a ribosome is not made up of a membrane, so that's why it's kind of an exception there. But prokaryotes do not have mitochondria, they do not have chloroplasts, they do not have nuclei, they do not have lysosomes. Any internal cellular structure that is surrounded by its own membrane, prokaryotes don't have those, right? So because prokaryotes tend to be very simple, they have their whole DNA genome just kind of floating around inside the cell. It's not necessarily organized or stored away anywhere. Because of how simple everything is organized and how simple the genetics work, prokaryotes tend to be very easy to manipulate. And kind of a rule of thumb in biotech and any other sort of uh, sciency lab application. If you can get away with doing something with a prokaryote, you probably will, just to kind of save yourself any headache. Now, eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells are obviously much more complex. They do contain a number of different internal organelles that each carry out very specific cell functions. So, for example, the nucleus is where all of our DNA and our chromosomes are stored, and that's where DNA replication and gene transcription are going to take place. The mitochondria are where uh, cellular respiration will take place. The endoplasmic reticulum is where a lot of protein and lipid synthesis will take place. So eukaryotic cells tend to be a lot more complex because they kind of divvy up the cell responsibilities and say, this organelle is responsible for this and this, this organelle is responsible for this, this, and this, and so on and so forth. So uh, eukaryotic cells are a lot more complex because there is a lot of intracellular communication that has to take place to get all of those activities coordinated. So a little bit more complex, you have to have a much better understanding of those cell biology uh, functions to really get a eukaryotic cell to do what you want it to do. So these organelles are themselves made up of the sorts of complex molecules that we talked about before, like proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, which are basically fats. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily include nucleic acids like DNA and RNA in there. Not every organelle is going to contain DNA or RNA. It would have to be an organelle that has its own genome, like mitochondria and chloroplasts. You won't find any nucleic acid uh, in, say, peroxisomes or lysosomes or anything like that. Uh, so there is a special reason why mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA and RNA, but maybe that's a story for another day. So in multicellular organisms, like we mentioned before, once you get past the organelle and into the cell level, uh, cells will not be individual organisms, but rather they will organize themselves into tissues. A tissue... Uh, like muscle tissue or epithelial tissue or adipose tissue is going to consist of cells that kind of all have a similar function and a similar purpose. You're not going to find a tissue that has a whole bunch of different cells that are all kind of doing their own thing. Usually they're all kind of working towards a similar goal. And then tissues will organize themselves into whole organs. For example, the stomach consists of epithelial tissue, smooth muscle tissue, uh, glandular tissue to secrete digestive enzymes, so a lot of different types of cells, but they all kind of have a function that lends itself well to whatever that particular organ is going to do. And obviously, if you're talking about the stomach, that is going to be in digestion. Okay, so that is going to do it for this video, so uh, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you will join us next time, and we will start talking a little bit more about taking what we know about cells and using it to, uh, to achieve our goals in biotech industry. So thanks again, and I will see you next time.